name is Avi Hoffman. Most of you know me by now. We are very proud to have with us this evening a distinguished scholar and author who is also a very dear friend of mine. Um, and he will be talking about Theresien, the model camp. Uh, the Theresien concentration camp, for those of you who may not know, was originally a holiday resort reserved for Czech Republic nobility. And it was transformed by the Nazis and their collaborators into the notorious concentration camp during World War II. And I would like to invite to the screen my dear friend um, and associate, uh, Robert Watson. Robert, why don't you join me? Great. Hello, Avi. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. So I'm going to leave you and our audience together for your presentation, and I look forward to joining you afterwards to discuss uh, what we've learned. Absolutely. Thank you, Thank you Avi. Uh, so everybody, I'm going to share screen, uh, and I put together some images for you, uh, and I'm delighted to work with Avi. He is a, a dear friend, and I've always admired uh, his uh, commitment to these vital issues, and Avi's an ideas factor. He always has a, a, a number of wonderful projects and ideas uh, cooking, so I'm always delighted to be a uh, part of them. And it's a pleasure to come before all of you to discuss this very important and deeply disturbing uh, topic. And I wanted to introduce this because of the programs that you have coming up uh, to just give you some context and background on Theresien and also the idea of it being a quote unquote model camp as uh, the Nazis saw it and referred to it. Um, so first off, Theresienstadt. Um, so this is roughly 30 miles north of Prague in what was Czechoslovakia, uh, is now of course the Czech Republic. And um, it was originally built by Emperor Joseph II. Uh, and he started construction back in 1780. It was about a 10 year project uh, to build a fort. Um, he named it in honor of his mother, Empress Maria Theresa, thus Theresa Theresienstadt, Theresa City, or Theresa's Fort, or Theresen for short. So it was named in honor of Maria Theresa. Um, now it, it served in a number of uh, capacities, as you heard Avi say, it was a, it was a resort, a getaway for uh, Czech uh, and European nobility. It was also a prison, and of course, uh, most notoriously and infamously, it was a ghetto and then a brutal uh, concentration uh, camp. So yes, it did serve as a resort uh, for nobility. And what an ironic twist on that. Uh, during World War I, it was basically for political prisoners and Russians. Uh, so anybody who opposed the, uh, the emperor uh, ended up uh, there, uh, as well as politicians who weren't loyal. Uh, you're looking at a picture of Gavrilo Princip. He was the person who assassinated the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, and that assassination really is what started World War I, kicked off the atrocities. He served in, um, in Theresen. And if you go today and take a tour, they point out some of the cells where, where he was and where other uh, legendary, or, or I should say infamous uh, individuals uh, stayed. So our story really begins with the Munich Agreement. This is in September of 1938. And with this was um, Hitler and the Nazis wanted to annex uh, Czechoslovakia. And of course they would Austria as well and occupy both regions. And Czechoslovakia and Austria really fell, as you know, disturbingly, pretty much without a shot. Uh, they wanted uh, Czechoslovakia for basically three reasons, and I listed them on the screen here. One, natural resources. Uh, Czechoslovakia, as you can see from the photograph here, uh, not only great cities like Prague and, 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 and ample waterways, uh, but a, a remarkable place for natural resources, ores and coal and minerals and therefore to fund the Nazi war machine, to help the Nazi war machine to run, uh, Hitler and his generals realized that they needed the natural resources from Czechoslovakia. So it was strategically extremely important. And all that would, of course, make Theresen all the more high profile. The Sudetenland and the idea of Lebensraum, I put on the screen here, this is this idea of breathing room or elbow room. Uh, that Hitler wanted 
a greater Third Reich, a larger Nazi empire. And he felt that Austria and Czechoslovakia properly belonged in a large, larger Nazi sphere of influence. Um, there were a lot of ethnic and native speaking Germans in the area. So Hitler wanted to extend that. He also had this uh, crazy and inaccurate view of history where he reinvented history to suggest that there was at one point a greater German civilization that extended pretty much throughout Europe. Uh, they even went so far as to suggest that it was Germanics who went to Rome and built the Roman Empire. It was Germanics that went to Greece and built the great Greek city-states and civilization. Here's how crazy it was. They even suggested that a German carpenter named Joseph had traveled to the Middle East, uh, got a local girl named Mary pregnant, and they had a Germanic son named Jesus. Yeah, they even, this is what they taught in German schools. Uh, so this idea of a breathing room, elbow room, and a greater German state, the Sudetenland, and the elbow room is Lebensraum. So Czechoslovakia was gobbled up. So it wasn't just an annexation. This was strategically important for the war, Czechoslovakia and Prague. It was vitally important for Hitler's vision of a larger Third Reich and important for his uh, inaccurate view of history and German culture, which all of which makes Theresien all the more important. To give you a sense of just how vital uh, Theresien and the Prague and, the, and Czechoslovakia were, the person put in charge of it was, was this person, uh, Reinhard Heydrich. Um, he was known as the Blonde Beast. He would later earn the dubious title, the Butcher of Prague. He was one of Hitler's absolute favorite officers for many reasons. He was tall, uh, looked Germanic, uh, blonde, uh, and he was absolutely heartless. He lacked a shred of humanity. Heydrich was one of the architects of the final solution and a lot of the horrific and uh, monstrous things that Hitler had done. So um, he was appointed um, uh, to head the area. In 1940, the Nazis created the Prague Gestapo. And one of the first things they did was they made Theresien a ghetto and uh, Jews were forced to live uh, in that ghetto. When Heydrich arrived on scene, he began a massive roundup of Jews and converted the uh, Theresien ghetto to a brutal concentration camp. It's estimated that 150,000 uh, prisoners uh, were brought there, including 15,000 children. Uh, those who were imprisoned at uh, Theresien included Czech Jews, uh, tens of thousands of Jews from Germany and Austria nearby, and several hundred uh, from the Netherlands and from Denmark. Now, Reinhard Heydrich would also have the dubious distinction of becoming the highest ranking Nazi to be assassinated during the war. And that would occur in 1942 when there was an underground uh, plot uh, to remove him. Some uh, Czech uh, rebels, uh, British intelligence, uh, local Jews, and others organized the assassination of him. He was so arrogant and had been so ruthless that he and only one driver would drive around in an open convertible. And he would say, no one would dare attack me because they would suffer the consequences. Well, guess what? Uh, he was assassinated. Um, Hitler organized a massive propaganda funeral uh, with Himmler, Goebbels, and others in attendance. Uh, they issued a commemorative stamp uh, with his likeness on it, built busts and statues to him. So it was uh, quite an accomplishment to assassinate him uh, one of the most brutal uh, of all the Nazis. So this gives you some sense because Heydrich was in charge of how vitally important and how visible Theresien was to the Nazis as their model concentration camp. Uh, so why the model camp? Uh, many reasons. Um, one was uh, a remarkable number of Jewish intellectuals and people of great renown, scholars, philosophers, scientists, artists, and musicians were uh, imprisoned in Theresien. It's estimated that there were enough world-class, enough great musicians that you could have fielded two entire world-class orchestras inside Theresien and several uh, impressive uh, chamber ensembles and quartets. 
just inside Theresien. Um, Theresien put on uh, performances. Uh, one of the most famous was Brundabar, which is the bumblebee, the children's operetta, uh, composed shortly before Theresien opened by Hans Krasse, uh, a Czech a Jew. And you're looking at him on the lower left part of your screen. On the right part of your screen, you're looking at the poster advertising performances of Brundabar. Uh, and at the bottom center, the main picture, there are the children of Theresien uh, being forced to perform this uh, children's operetta. So it was performed several times in Theresien. When they finished uh, the performances, however, Prasa was sent to Auschwitz, where he was killed immediately upon, he murdered immediately upon arrival. So the camp had an artistic, musical, and intellectual bent that was quite extraordinary. Uh, the arts, paper, uh, crayon, a chalk, paint, a number of things were smuggled in throughout uh, Theresien's history. It's estimated that there were 6,000 drawings made mostly by the children of Theresien. And on the left, you can see two of them and then a larger one there. And you can see from these three that I picked uh, that survived that the children of Theresien were painting the experiences they were enduring. Uh, as you can see in the top, the train on the bottom, and of course, people being rounded up in the main picture, Jews being rounded up to be brought uh, to Theresien. Um, these uh, artistic renderings, as well as musical scores, poems, and so on, were smuggled out of Theresien, hidden all throughout the camp, and others dug into the dirt and buried them in hopes that after they were killed, that future individuals might find the art. And indeed, uh, some of it has survived. And it's an impressive touching and further tells the story of this model camp with an artistic bent. Uh, one, of those, uh, one of those great artists inside was the Jewish poet, Pavel Friedman, Pavel Friedman. Um, and Friedman uh, was a prolific poet, but perhaps best known for a poem, Butterfly, uh, about the ghetto and later camp, also known as I Never Saw Another Butterfly, which he composed inside uh, Theresen. I put the words up, let me just read this for you. Uh, the la and they, this is the translation, of course. Uh, the last, the very last, so richly, brightly, dazzlingly yellow. Perhaps if the sun's tears would sing against a white stone. Such, such a yellow is carried lightly, way up high. It went away, I'm sure, because it wished to kiss the world goodbye. For seven weeks I've lived here, penned up inside this ghetto, but I have found what I love here, the dandelions call to me and the white chestnut branches in the court. Only I never saw another butterfly. That butterfly was the last one. Butterflies don't live in here in the ghetto. And shortly after composing this, Pavel Friedman was uh, sent by train to Auschwitz, where he was murdered immediately on arrival. Um, operation embellishment. So things would change in Theresien in October of 1943. The Danish King Christian uh, demanded that the Nazis uh, offer uh, an inspection uh, and give a tour to two representatives from the Danish government uh, because he heard rumors about how horrific uh, Theresien was uh, for the several hundred Danes that were there. So um, he made a request. He wanted to have his two representatives meet with the, uh, I put it on the screen here, an estimated 466 uh, Danes inside Theresien. Uh, the Nazis agreed, and they saw this as an opportunity for propaganda. So the Nazis agreed, and they not only invited the two reps from the Danish government, but two representatives from the International Red Cross. But the meeting would not happen in October of 43. They had to wait until June of 44. Why? It gave the Nazis time to plan propaganda. What they did was they fed the prisoners so they did not look starved and skeletal. They brought in fresh clothing, allowed them to bathe, especially the children of Theresien, who were fed and clothed so that they could show off that it is a model camp and that the Nazis are treating the Jews fairly and humanely. They even redid the downtown and the route leading into Theresien. They filled the storefronts with fresh baked bread and produce and pastries uh, over the top. 
They even had, as you're ready to get the Teresian, an entire candy store with shelves of chocolate bonbons in the windows. So when the two Red Cross and two Danish government representatives drove through, they were very impressed with the uh, the largesse, the uh, uh, you know the amount of food and everything. Of course, everything was clean. Now, the person who led the tour was none other than the man you're looking at, uh, Adolf Eichmann. So Eichmann uh, led the delegation. Now, the delegation was kept on a very strict tour route. They could only go certain areas. And whenever people in the delegation tried to ask a question of one of the prisoners, the prisoners were not allowed to answer. Several prisoners were saying to, uh, risking their lives to say to the delegates, be sure to look closely, very closely, or be sure to look everywhere. They were trying to tip them off. Uh, and I, we don't know, but I'm sure several were beaten, if not killed, uh, for doing that. Um, tragically, this inspection, this tour worked for the Nazis, the propaganda worked. The uh, representatives were duped. The International Red Cross wrote a report saying that given the scarcity during the war, given warlike conditions, all things being said, that individuals are being treated very fairly and humanely into raisin, and the Jews are being treated well. They were completely duped by Eichmann and Nazi propaganda. How they could be so easily fooled and write such a report, which played right into Nazi hands and ulterior motives is just beyond me. Um, part of the ruse, of course, was the children. You can see here, the kids look clean, they look healthy, they look well-dressed. Uh, yes, because they were just briefly, whereas thousands, of course, died before and thousands would die immediately thereafter and of course the food and everything would stop so the children were shown off and uh, the children were told to play and the representatives from the red cross watched the children play on the right you can see they even organized a soccer game uh, and they had a game and they had the children in the stands and some of the adults in the stands and the players would even run over and hug and and, and tease the children who would giggle and yell and well of course if you're a kid and you finally have some entertainment you're excited and of course, when this was over, uh, it was back to uh, normal. Another part of the ruse was uh, musical performances. The individual you're looking at is the, is the Jewish composer, Raphael Schachter. Um, what's remarkable is Schachter put on 16 uh, musical performances. He had a group of 150 singers, and you can see him conducting there at the bottom of your screen. Uh, he was told to put on Giuseppe Verdi's Requiem, and he did so with 150 singers and one old legless piano accompanying. Now, here's what's remarkable about uh, the composer Schechter. He had only one page of the score. He organized all the rest, the harmonies, the entire thing from memory, which is just to give you a sense of his talent. Um, now, what the Nazis announced, and ironically enough, Requiem, would be the performance by those about to die. Um, the prisoners, the Nazis announced, and I have it on the screen here, would sing to their captors words that could not be spoken. Eichmann was in attendance and belittled Schachter and the Jewish performers by saying, those crazy Jews singing their own requiem. Uh, after the 16th and final performance, which was part of the propaganda ruse, uh, Schachter was deported to Auschwitz in October of 44, where he was murdered the day after arriving at Auschwitz, which was the same for uh, uh, all the other famous artists inside there. Uh, another part of the ruse for the model camp that was to raise in was a movie. Um, the Jewish uh, filmmaker, Kurt Geron, uh, was told to make a movie. And given limited resources there, you can see uh, him filming it. Uh, he was given 11 days to make a movie. Uh, and he did. The technical title of the film was Terrationstadt, a documentary film of the Jewish resettlement. Notice how they reframed and branded for propaganda all this. The nickname given by Eichmann uh, and uh, senior Nazis was the Fuhrer gives a village to the Jews. So they made the movie. It was all part of this model camp operation embellishment uh, to make this look good. And uh, shortly after the film, uh, was finished, of course, Geron and much of his cast and crew were sent by train to Auschwitz, where he too 
was murdered the day after arriving in Auschwitz, just like all the other uh, artists and intellectuals in the camp that were sent there. Uh, so that was the ruse, the oper what the Nazis called Operation Embellishment, uh, which made this the model camp. Here's a picture of what you see today. Let me just end with the legacy. Uh, Theresen, unlike uh, some of the most uh, notorious and unimaginable uh, camps like uh, Auschwitz and Treblinka and Dachau and, and others, uh, Buchenwald, um, it, it is not as uh, well known. It was not a death camp. However, I think that needs to be revisited. Um, how can you say it wasn't a death camp when 33,000 people inside the camp, nearly all of them Jews, died at Theresen from overcrowding, malnourishment, lack of hygiene, diseases, and brutal labor uh, inside the camp. It did have a small crematorium before gas ovens. Um, 88,000 uh, prisoners in Theresen were sent by train to Auschwitz or Treblinka, most Auschwitz, where they were murdered on arrival. How can you not call it a death camp? Uh, the legacy of Theresen is this. Of the 150,000 people brought in there, only a little over 17,000 lived through the Holocaust. And less than 150 of Theresen's children, which were the subject of Operation Embellishment and this grand ruse that was the model camp, survived. In closing, a lot of what happened, including the model camp, the ruse, and so forth and so on, Operation Embellishment, inside Theresen, was part of Hitler and the Nazis testing the world, much like um, Kristallnacht, uh, the night of broken glass. Uh, Hitler wanted to see what the world's response would be. And tragically, it was not what it should have been. Much like earlier in 1935 with the Nuremberg race laws, Hitler and other Nazis wanted to see what the world's response would be. And tragically, it was not enough. With the ship to St. Louis, uh, the voyage of the dam, that was turned away in Havana and turned away where everywhere it went, including the United States and even Canada. Uh, Hitler and the Nazis wanted to see the world's response to that. And once again, tragically, it wasn't enough. And in the case of Theresen, um, Operation Embellishment worked and the world's response was again, uh, unforgivably inadequate, which emboldened the Nazis to take the next step. Uh, so Theresen played a central role in the larger Nazi uh, rain. Uh, thank you and enjoy the uh, this wonderful program that Avi and his associates have put together. Thank you. Uh, Robert, Robert, Robert. Number one, I am always so, you know, blown away by your um, ability to tell a story and make it come to life. And Teresa, and especially for me, and I've been there, is always it always shocks me anew. So before I ask you a couple of questions, I just want everyone who's watching right now to know that immediately following this event at 730, uh, we are presenting the internet premiere of a virtual reading of the off-Broadway musical drama, Signs of Life, which is based on the true story of the ghetto, uh, the Czech ghetto of Theresien. And it really tells some of the artistic and academic stories that were forced, these Jews who were forced, as Robert just told us, into beautifying, you know, this ghetto, making it look good. So the International Red Cross would see how gorgeous and everybody's treated so well. Um, so that musical will be following this event. And immediately following that, we're gonna do a post-reading talk back with the creative team, uh, the authors, the producers, and the the directors of that uh, virtual reading. Um, so please stay with us and, and learn something about how horrific this world can be and how beautiful it can be as well, because we still have the art, we still have the music. Um, and so, Robert, a couple of things. You know, I, I, as I said, I'm always so, you know, blown away by, by your presentations because it, it it challenges me to think about a few things. And in this particular case, I, I wanna talk about specifics and then something a little more general. So specifically, so the Brundebar, the creative forces 
within the ghetto, within the camp. Um, how, and, and this is such a, a subjective question, how do you think people who are creative could create under those circumstances? I mean, if I were in the concentration camp and somebody said, okay, do your show, I, I don't know that I could just get up and write a show or do a show or compose an opera. I, I'm, I, I struggle with that. What do you, what do you think? Yes, uh, Avi, like you, I, I, I've been to, to Raisin, and like you, I was just uh, floored as I walked through it, and we actually had met a woman who had been in there, and there's so few survivors of to Raisin. Um, and I'm going back again, not this June, but next June, for another visit to Prague, and I'm taking a tour to to Raisin. What you said is, um, you know, on one hand, how does somebody even survive? Uh, I made my students last semester read Elie Wiesel's Night. And one of the themes that came out of it from the students was, how do you even survive, yet alone find it in yourself to write a book, yet alone a Pulitzer Prize winning, one of the greatest books ever read, written. Um, as an artist, it is who you are. This runs through your marrow, Avi. And maybe on one hand, it was a way that they found to to a form of resistance. I always saw it as a form of resistance. Amidst horror, hopelessness, and death, we are going to produce beautiful works of, of poetry, beautiful works of music. We're going to put on operas. And as you, as you saw, uh, find a way of smuggling in art so that the children can tell their stories of, of being brought in on a train or their family being marched into the, the ghetto. So in a way, it's a form of resistance. Um, one of the things that I always focus on when I teach the Holocaust on campus is too often you have this view that why did Jews just go to the train stations? Well, on one hand, if your enemy has tanks and your enemy has machine guns and you haven't eaten, you don't have a whole lot of choice. On the other hand, who could possibly, I mean, I'm a rational fact-driven person, but if I had heard this was happening, I can't wrap my brain around that this happened. Here we are decades later, and I still can't wrap my brain around it. On the other hand, that's not an accurate statement because there was resistance everywhere. Folks took to the fields. They took to the forests. They lived in the forest. There were uprisings in the ghettos. There was resistance in the camps. There were escapes. There were uh, uh, intelligence was passed out. So a lot of this art, the way I framed it, is on one hand, artists doing what they do to preserve a degree and an ounce of humanity and a great degree of hope for those inside. On the other hand, I see all this art as a form of resistance. And so I think that's the way to look at it. Let, let me also add to that because you reminded me as you were speaking, I've done a lot of research into the ghettos and it turns out that very often these concert performances, these plays that were done or written included codes by the resistance yeah, to yeah. their members so yeah. if the somebody an actor in the play said the baker just made 12 loaves of pumpernickel bread what it really meant is that there were 12 guns hidden behind the baker's yeah, shop yeah. Right, and right. then the right people would go, and it's really a fascinating. And we don't sure. really know a lot about this yet. These are things that are now starting to to be discovered. Um, just so everybody also knows, you know, uh, Brundebar, which you mentioned, has now been revived since the nineteen nineties. There have been productions of Brundebar done in the UK, in the United States, all over the world. Tony Kushner. Uh, the famous, you know, Tony, mm -hmm. Orton, uh, 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 the writer for Lincoln and several other things, just uh, an award winning script writer and author. He's, right. he's extraordinary. Yeah. Well, he created a version of Brundabar as well that was produced mm -hmm. and has been produced all over the world. Um, so <laughs> I, I keep coming back to this because, you know, you keep saying it and I keep agreeing with you. How does the world, how does such evil how does a human being go to such an extreme evil? What I, I, I still, and this is kind of the general question, because, you know, we talk about these things and you do the lecture and you go, yes. And then they sent him to Auschwitz and he was killed the next day. And then they showed everybody how great it was. How do 
I, I cannot wrap my head around the process yeah. of how well, a person becomes so evil. Right. So a, a, a couple of things on that. That's the million dollar question. Of course, I don't have an answer for it. And of course, the, 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 the frustrating irony of this is you, me, we all have spent our lives thinking how this could have happened. Why? How could it have happened? I give a whole lecture where I try to ask the why question and I don't have an answer, but I come up with some theories and ideas to bounce off people. Uh, the other depths of humanity, you know, we, we all say never again, never forget. Um, and we try to put teeth to those words because the world still continues to suffer from genocide and, and instances of evil. The Holocaust is many things. The world's worst instance of genocide you know, a, a period of night and darkness for humanity. It is many things, but it's also, and this is not meant to sound callous or flippant in any way, but it is a teachable moment. Uh, you cannot teach a group of students about the Holocaust and not have them be profoundly impacted and not sort of knock them off their pedestal of innocence and naivete. And of course, critical thinking and realism are things we should all be trying to do in education. What I do to try to answer, so that's my background on that, my, my backstory, to try to answer that question, there is no answer, but one thing I've looked at is I've gone back and looked at what did Hitler require in the schools in the 1930s? So Avi, if you took a time machine back to 35, when the Nuremberg race laws were passed, what were you learning when you were six, seven, eight, nine, and 10? Well, on one hand, you were taken from your parents much of the day and put into Hitler Youth or German Maiden camps, which were just brainwashing academies 24-7. Young boys were taken to facilities which had huge statues, which looked like warriors from ancient Greece. And there were banners and flags everywhere and marching and to imbue you with ultra nationalism. But here's what you'd be reading. You would be reading that Jews killed Jesus because they wanted to take over the world. And therefore, anything you do to a Jew is justified. You know what you'd be reading in the curriculum in science class? You'd be reading that Jews caused the bubonic plague, the Black Death in the 1340s, which killed one out of every three in Europe. Why? Jews were trying to take over the world. You know what you'd be reading in your- Because uh, of the elders of Zion. Yes, of course, and that's where we're going. Uh, right. You'd be reading that um, Jews kill Christian boys to use their blood to make matzah and Passover ceremonies. And that's why Christian boys disappear. It's Jews. You'd be reading that Jews are never loyal to their government. Uh, the Alfred, Captain Alfred Dreyfus trial back in the late 1890s. Uh, Dreyfus, a French Jew, was a, by all accounts, a remarkable officer, but he was framed. Later, he was found to be innocent, but that story never got out. Right. So what you would be learning from a tender age all day, every day, is Jews are trying to take over the world and kill Christians. And um, the, the Nazis, if, if, if you know, they were many things, but one thing they were was remarkably effective in their propaganda. To take a culture and a country, Avi, if you and I were in, in Germany in 1932, the year before Hitler rose to power, we could agree probably that the German people were among the most traveled, the most well-read German scientific musical, artistic, right. and, and educational institutions were the envy of the world. Mm -hmm. And within a few short years, right. they committed the most unspeakable offenses in all of history. So therein, I think, is where, where we need to pursue the why and how. Right. And therein, I think, is the lesson that we all must be double, triple vigilant. Uh, because if you could take that scenario in just a few years, and all around the world today, the last couple of years, we've seen troubling signs of a resurgence of anti-Semitic violence here in the U.S. and globally. But it's not just anti-Semitic anymore. It's anti-Semitic. It's anti-Muslim. It's anti-Uyghur. It's anti-Christian. It's anti-hatred is the problem. Yes. That concept that you can teach hatred from the time children are born, if they are taught... And again, I think you're right. Everything goes back to academics and education. We should be teaching kids from preschool to, you know, through college, 
acceptance lessons. How do you accept different? How do you accept the others? Um, sure. You know, and you've kind of answered my last question. Um, you know, I try to, to I'm, I, I'm trying to veer away from the never forget um, words to a different, more positive way, which is always remember. You know, never forget to me is becoming cliche. Never forget, they're saying it about a million different things now. It's no longer even just about the Holocaust. Never forget is something you say for almost anything that you feel is a horrible right. crime. Um, but always remember how it happened, how easily it happened. Um, and my last question was going to be, how did the world remain silent? Right. And how does the world remain silent today? Right. How do we not learn from history, you're a historian. How does that happen at a governmental level? Right. Well, I, I, the idea of always remember is a profound idea. Um, and you are right. You know, never forget, never again. These powerful terms have been appropriated by every organization, every cause, every incident. And if it's, if it's mass appropriated, uh, it, it loses some of its special meaning, which is, a, which is disastrous. Uh, in and of itself, um, but yeah, you know. So I'm, I'm, I'm on that. I, what my, I have two kids. They're older now, but when they were little, I was always struck, Avi, when I would take them to the park, or we would go to a a little class to play musical instruments or to the beach. My kids played with every. You have kids of every race, religion, background, and they don't care. At some point, we teach them that religious differences are worth segregating your friends and living your life at some point we teach them that linguistic and racial differences are profound but as children they just don't see it you know as an historian i i, I always say it's hard to be an optimist if you're an historian it's hard to not be an alcoholic with a liver issue if you're an historian because <laughs> the lessons of history are clear uh the holocaust is as i said many things the world's worst and i'm not minimizing it, the world's worst. But what you find is there has never been a period in history. There has never been a culture. There's never been a country since the advent of a, you know, uh, a nation state. There's never been a period of time or a region that has not had the worst of humanity present. Genocide, rape, murder, uh, you name it, to the point where one wonders if this is not human nature, that some genetic natural selection tendency toward violence and kin selection is not so deeply ingrained that maybe hate and war are the norm and maybe you know Elie Wiesel and Gandhi are the exceptions to the rule you know I don't want to accept that uh, and I don't teach that because it's often fatalistic but I do think we need a healthy dose of realism and that is in direct answer to your question fear is oftentimes a more powerful force than fact or love or tolerance or acceptance. Um, scapegoating, blame mongering, jingoism, xenophobia, all these forms of, of defining the other uh, are very, very innate human traits. They must be because every culture, every period in time does it. So I think you're on to something in that we must, whether it's through the arts, whether it's through music, whether it's through universities, whether it's K through 12, we must educate uh, each generation in the lessons of the past, lest they forget them. And we must educate each generation and not just tolerance, right. but a full acceptance and embracing and moving beyond it. And that's an uphill battle because the lessons of history uh, and the lessons today of what's been happening recently uh, with fear replacing fact and paranoia replacing civility. It's, uh, and, and I'll end with this, Avi. Uh, several years ago, I created a program at our university at Lynn called Project Civitas. Civitas is the Latin word for civility and citizenship. And what's interesting about that is the word for civility and the word for citizenship are one and the same. Mm -hmm. Boy, we have lost that these days. So what we do on campus is we do little things like training our student government to be the kind of civil role models for the rest of the campus, modeling positive leadership as leaders among the student body, encouraging our students to open the door for others, you know, and it's working. I would say it's been three to four years now 
where I have walked to any building and I don't have a student run to open the door for me. And, yeah. and, and I used to complain constantly about, and I remember when my wife, my ex-wife was pregnant years ago. She was talking about, she was coming out of a, a restaurant with her hands full and she's eight months pregnant. And the two young guys walked in front of her and let the door fall and shut on her. Okay. You know, we used to not do, um, we, can, we can train that, we can model that. We uh, require all of our students to spend three weeks every January engaged in community service, working with veterans, cleaning the beach, painting homes with Habitat for Humanity. Yeah. So the, and we guess here's what we do. We give them academic credit and a grade for doing that. Why? Because that way we reiterate the lesson. And I think this is where you were going. And this is our answer for all this, lest we all feel that there's, it's hopeless. Getting an education. Being educated means more than you can read Shakespeare and you can do calculus. It means understanding that you have a responsibility to give back to your community, to house the homeless, shoe the children, feed the hungry. So by, by incorporating that into our core curriculum, grading it and giving them credit for it, they realize that their civility and community service is as essential as math, English, science, and their history classes. So. Um, here in our little campus over the last few years, I've seen a profound difference. So I think it can happen. Now, how do we bottle this and put it on a macro level? That's where you come in, Avi, because you reach big audiences with your artistic and your musical and theatrical performances. You know, I think it's happening. I'm the optimist always. I think there is a global evolution that is happening now all over the world. People are starting to realize on a personal level that they cannot continue with hatred. They have to continue with acceptance and love. Ladies and gentlemen, we are so privileged to have with us um, this scholar, author and professor of Lynn University's uh, history department, Robert Watson, my friend, my associate, thank you so much for this incredibly enlightening lecture. Please stay with us. It's 7.30. We have Signs of Life, the musical drama of virtual reading, when survival depends on hiding the truth. How does the truth survive? That's the question that that musical will ask. And following that, a post reading talk back with the creative forces behind signs of life robert thank you again so much i look forward to speaking with you soon about this and many other wonderful projects that we can do together it's always a pleasure to collaborate with you avi and keep up the great work thank you great. thank you so much see you very soon everybody thank you <laughs>